because I think a lot of people might be interested in Velociraptor. I want a nice clean recording with nothing else on it. So I added it to the projects on this web app page. Not that it's really right for this topic, but it's just the uh, only class to hit the appropriate time. But this is an interesting issue, I think, for anybody in the world of security. Um, so Velociraptor, I was very happy to learn about. Uh, in the instant response class that I'm not teaching this semester, but I taught in the past, I tried to use a product called GUR, Google Rapid Response. And that was a pretty nice product, but it didn't keep working. The next time I, uh, when I tried to use it, it wasn't working. They didn't seem to keep it updated well enough. The installer didn't install very well. And it was very frustrating. And Velociraptor is inspired by GUR and OS Query. Now, OS Query is a platform independent system that lets you ask questions about machines on your network, whether they're Linux or Mac or Windows. And the idea is you can do threat hunting. You can look through your network to find out um, what machines have indicators of compromise or extra listening processes or listening network ports or strange registry keys, you know, all the usual stuff you need to do an in instant response. Now, uh, we instant response is not at the center of this uh, web hacking class, but it is an important issue. I mean, when you have some kind of security problem on your network, like typically something like a malware infection, then you analyze the malware to figure out what's going on, and then you try to find out what other machines are infected with that malware and track it down. So this is a very common thing that I say, um, this malware creates this file, and I want to know how many machines have that file. So let me get logged into my Windows machine here. All right, good. So anyway, this Velociraptor project is here. You can do it for extra credit if you like. And uh, it's really very nice and easy now. All you do is download and install the Windows version of this software. It has it for every operating system. But just to make it easy, I tried doing it all on Windows, and it actually worked on Windows, which I was very pleased to see. It doesn't correctly set the path on my Windows machine, so you have to give it the full path to the program. But that's a small problem. and these guys were so nice that they included a special command. You can launch the program with the switch GUI, and it will immediately launch a test version of it just so you can learn about it, which is very polite of them. I appreciate that. So here's my Windows machine. And by the way, I had to make it quite um, powerful for this to work. I got it up to four processors and 16 gigs of RAM. Parts of it were running really slowly. So I don't know if you really need that much. Um, it's I put it on the 129S page just so you can do it this semester, but its natural home will be in 152, and it'll be in the 152 homework next semester. <coughs> 152 is the instant response class, and that's really the natural home for this project. So anyway, all you need is one administrator command prompt, and then you run that code there, which will just run the Velociraptor executable in GUI mode. The GUI is a special mode of it, which starts the server on the local machine, and it starts a client on the local machine. Now, the point is one Velociraptor server can have like hundreds or thousands of clients. It's like a domain controller. You'll have this one central incident response server, and all these clients in your network, your Windows and Linux and Mac boxes, and from this central location, you will then launch hunts to hunt to see what's out there and gather the data and examine it all. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to have one client, which is going to be equal to this machine. So once you launch this thing, it's going to uh, tell me, connected to this control, started there. And uh, I th may I, maybe it's still starting. I'm not sure. Anyway, once it's going, it starts a web server at here, localhost 8889. So let's see if that's going to work. Good. It's working. But of course, it's complaining that it's not a... Um, valid digital certificate, which is common for these tools like Splunk and everything. They don't bother to pay for a certificate, really, because they don't know your IP address. So it's got self-signed certificates, so you have to go approve that. Each browser has their own process to approve that, just so you know that um, you're not really making a fully secure connection here. So now this is the GUI. You see the cute little dinosaur? And you can start by looking at your server's state. And that'll show you some graphs. Here's the CPU. And you see the CPU is busy, but now it's come down. 
and went back up. Here's my connected clients. There were zero, and now there's one connected client, which is this machine. So the connection is up, and it's been up for a couple of minutes. So uh, looks like I have a client. So I can go up here and show all to see all the clients. And of course, there is only one. And here it is, my Windows 10 machine. It has some kind of ID number. So when I click that ID number, I can now examine what's on this client. It gives me some general information, like what operating system it's running and such. And then I can gather data from the client. For, I can go to the virtual file system. And this is all very much like that GER product that I wrote projects about a while ago. So it's pretty, very much the same kind of thing. And now I have different categories. Like I can go through the file system and then it will show me C and D. If I go to drive C, it will then show me subdrives here. And if I was to look in, say, Windows, if I go to a folder that I haven't already indexed, then it will tell me no data available. You have to refresh it here. So I have to hit this button, and it will load the contents of that one folder. It doesn't automatically index the entire file system to, you know, I assume to save CPU and bandwidth. You probably don't really want to look everywhere. You're going to do targeted looks. So now you can see the, uh, the contents here in the C Windows directory. So you can explore the file system and hunt for files. And I can collapse that. The NTFS gives me essentially the same information, but referring to raw objects. Uh, backslash, backslash, dot, backslash, C. This is the direct uh, reference from the root of the Windows, file, Windows uh, operating system to refer to objects directly. And, uh, but for all practical purposes, the same as C for most cases. And then there's the registry which again is the same story. So you can look at each key local machine and there's no data, you have to refresh it. So you can dig down in here and look at registry keys, which is very important in the Windows forensics world. You can find out all sorts of things and almost all malware makes changes in the registry, for example, to make it automatically restart. And then um, there's artifacts here. And here you have some generic info that it creates. Um, and you can go in here and look at it. And here's some basic information it has. But we'll look more at this stuff later. So let me take a look at my instructions here. So you get connected, you view your server state, go to the virtual file system, find some registry information, and that's the first flag. Then you collect a file. I want you to collect this uh, YAML file, which is part of Velociraptor, so I know it'll be there. This is actually the configuration file for the Velociraptor server. It runs on a couple of simple text files. And you can see it's got a certificate here. That's the self-signed certificate uh, used for the web server, I think. And then you can look at artifacts. So it's the hamburger and then artifacts. Let's take a look at that. That's good, clean fun. Here's the hamburger. That expands this bar. And now you can look at um, view artifacts. Artifacts are the um, things you look for in a forensic investigation. That's what they call them. The idea is that most of the time they're not deliberately placed like log entries. They are the accidental things caused by people using a machine, which is what you look at when you're trying to find out what's been happening on the machine. And so look at all these artifacts that are predefined. Now you can write your own queries, but um, if I look here, let's see if there are any that look fun. Here's Linux. I don't care about that or Mac. I care about Windows because I'm using a Windows system. And I uh, thought there would be more. Okay, let me find out uh, the ones I liked before. Windows network listening ports. That's what I thought. So let's try. Um, I'll just add one here. Add. Uh, that's how I'd create a new one. That's not what I want to do. All right, just a moment. In the top right, type Windows, and I should see some Windows. All right, what's the deal here? Windows. There we are. Here's various kinds of Windows. All right, so I can see the Chrome history and the Edge history. Um, I can see mutants, which are labels in the uh, memory space handles used to label objects, commonly used by malware. Um, I can run Yara, so it will do, you know, Yara is a common search engine like grep that you use to, to match, find files that have characteristic strings in them. I can look at the event logs. 
In fact, I wonder if I can look at the login event log. That would be nice. Alternate login, DHCP, RDP authentication, scheduled tasks. Let's take a look at scheduled tasks. Let's see what happens here. Here it tells you about that event. And uh, there's the code that finds it that's written for you. And so uh, how do, let's just look at it. So collecting listening ports, I go to collected artifacts. OK. And then I add it there. Right. OK. So this was just looking at the artifacts that are available. I have to go to collected artifacts to actually do a query on the server. OK. And so now I've already got it here, listening ports. Um, but I added it by hitting plus here. And now I can put in anything I want. Let's see if I can add something else useful. Firefox history. Sure, let's get the Firefox history. So select that artifact, then configure parameters. And there aren't any, so I'll just uh, specify resources. I don't think I care about any of that. This is how much CPU it can consume and how much data it will bring down. Then I review it. And notice it's really simple script to do that. doesn't really have to do very much. And then launch it. And so now you can see some text scrolling by. This is the machine getting these requests and launching it on the, on the uh, client. So it is now added to this list, Firefox history. So if I click on that, I should be able to see the results. And there we go. So I went to Mozilla.org and privacy. Looks like I haven't used Firefox. Went to GitHub to download the Flare VM when I installed this machine. OK, there I went to my website. Here I went to Zoom. OK, so there you are. Uh, you got the Fire Eye, the Firefox history from that machine. And you know you could get, looks like, about 100 pre-made artifacts for all the usual stuff. And you can write those little scripts to customize it to pick up anything you want. And you can schedule scans to run periodically to look for things. So this really is the cat's meow. And it's the reason why I decided to write this project and got very excited is because this company just got bought by um, Rapid7, the makers of Metasploit. And they're a big, important company. So the fact that they bought it means that this product is going to have a real lifetime. It's going to be controlled by a main company. It's going to be supported. They may modify it, but it means it's worth knowing. Is this based on a VM? Uh, no, it is not. It's just software running on a machine. I happen to be running it on a VM, but it's not a VM. It's just the script that runs on your machine. You install it like any other software because it has to be fast. It's a very good question. And that's why there's a different version of it for every operating system. If you go here, you'll see they got it for um, Darwin is the Mac, FreeBSD, Linux, Windows. So you install it directly on whatever you want. And by the way, of course, they don't recommend using a Windows server as the main server because it wastes too much resources. They recommend using Linux for the main server. So it will, like headless Linux server is what you probably should have there to get the most uh, efficiency. But I just put it on Windows as the easiest way to learn how to use it. And they talk casually about it, controlling hundreds or thousands of clients. So I'm sure you'd need a pretty beefy server for that, but apparently it's uh, not impossible. And that's, uh, that's what you do. Uh, yes, you can customize it. It is a framework. You can write stuff in that thing is called Velociraptor Query Language, VQL. You can write your own queries, and I think you can probably add other kinds of extension modules too. Um, there's a training course going on right now that I saw the first four videos of is how I got started, and there might be more now. I think I put it at the end of this page. Yeah, here's the Velociraptor course. It's, here's the documentation, and here's the course. Somebody's doing a video course, and the first four lessons are out. This is what I looked at, and there will be more. Throughout May, uh, there's this course, and I don't know if the course is free or not, but the videos afterwards are free, so it's coming. And uh, like I say, I expect, um, now that it's been bought by Rapid7, I would expect over the next six months or a year, they will be upgrading it, improving it, changing it, making it better, and making it a commercial product. So I think there's a real future in this. I've been hearing about it for about a year, and uh, I didn't know if it was going to survive or not, but uh, 
Now it looks pretty good like it's going to survive. So I think it's, uh, it's worth learning the basics of how it works. And uh, that's what I wanted to show you. So I'm going to stop.